of definition. Even though the field is, or maybe because the field is very young, uh, different authors have different definition of what a two-sided market is. Uh, if I take uh, the Rocher-Tirol uh, definition, which was the original one, the Rocher-Tirol definition is largely uh, uh, based on the role of the price structure between the two sides, the price on the first side and the price on the second side. And the definition, which is the, given by uh, uh, Tirol and Rocher, says that the platform can affect the volume of transactions by charging more to one side of the market and reducing the price paid to the other side in an equal amount. In other words, in that case, uh, the structure, the relationship between the two, market, the two prices is a decision which is going to uh, uh, possibly increase uh, the uh, sales or the volume of activity of the platform. Now, if we think about a circumstance in a one-sided market where we have two sets of customers and two prices, uh, we know that a little bit, it's price discrimination, for example. So we have, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, Vuitton, for example, uh, which is a well-known luxury brand clearly has several different types of customers. The Asians are extremely uh, uh, engaged by the Vuitton brand, uh, brand and uh, they are willing to pay extraordinary prices. And then the rest of the world, uh, they are willing to pay high prices, but not extraordinary prices. The result is that we've got two different prices, but the proportion between the two doesn't play a role. Uh, what plays a role is the fact that uh, Vuitton tries to maximize its profit in the Asian markets on the one side and tries to maximize its profit using a different price because there's a different price elasticity in the other markets. Now, Roche Tirol say uh, two-sided markets are precisely markets where the structure, the relationship between the level of the price on one side and the level of the price on, uh, and on another side may have a crucial importance for the volume of sales uh, of the platform. A um, couple of examples, uh, one of them non-controversial, the other one immediately controversial, supermarkets. One can think of supermarkets as being an intermediary between suppliers and final consumers, uh, and there's a platform in between, uh, and the platform determines uh, what price it buys from the suppliers, and on the, on the other side, at what price it resells to, to the customers. Okay. Um, and by lowering the price at which it buys from the uh, suppliers, it may make better business or be seen as a discounter and be able to sell more on the uh, size of the uh, final consumers. Uh, so clearly, a supermarket would come into this logic with one exception, which would be the exception where the supplier would impose a resale price. Because if the supplier imposes a resale price, then the, the market is not a two-sided market anymore. The platform doesn't play a role in setting the difference between the prices on the two sides. Uh, it doesn't have any uh, degree of freedom uh, there. So outside of resale price maintenance, the supermarket is a uh, platform, has two sets of customers, and tries to uh, see what is the margin that it should take uh, to try to uh, ensure that its global volume of profit is uh, maximum. Uh, there's another example which is discussed in the literature, which is more complicated, shopping malls. We'll come back to uh, shopping malls in a while. Uh, but some people argue that under the definition of Rocher and Tirol, a shopping mall is not really a two-sided market because the, the shopping mall would be what? A, an intermediary between uh, the stores on the one hand and the customers on the other hand. And the way in which the shopping mall is, is uh, set uh, with all kinds of equipments that the consumers use for free attracts consumers, which in turn attracts the, supply, the uh, stores. And that in that sense, there is a, a, a two-sided market with rents being paid by the stores on one side and uh, uh, people 
uh, not paying for the use of the shopping mall in most of the time. Maybe they pay a little bit for the parking lot, but uh, uh, in many cases, they don't even pay for that uh, uh, if they buy things. Um, the difficulty there is that there are direct transactions between the customers and the stores. And if the stores are unhappy about the high rent that uh, the platform uh, charges them for being in the shopping mall, uh, they are usually at liberty to increase their prices and, and pass on to the consumer. Uh, they, in other words, they can change the allocation of costs which has been set by the, by the platform, uh, something which in principle uh, means that the platform doesn't have the power uh, to change the structure uh, of prices to increase its volume because in this case there can be side payments between the two sides. Uh, so some people argue that uh, uh, a shopping mall is not a perfect uh, two-sided market, but a supermarket would be. Um, one of the things, when one follows the Rocher Tirol approach, one of the things which is clear, and I've already uh, mentioned it, uh, oops, yeah, is um, that a market will be, to decide whether a market is two-sided or not, one has first to look at whether the platform has the possibility to set the terms on both sides in a way which will maximize its profit without those prices being, uh, 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 being challenged by side payments between the two sides. Um, but that, as, I, as we said, will depend on the contractual clauses. Uh, for example, uh, as uh, mentioned uh, earlier, uh, the fact that uh, RPM, for example, would change a two-sided market into a one-sided market. Um, the governance structure and the legal provisions uh, of the uh, case that we're considering. For example, think about a, a banking system or credit card system where uh, the, uh, the stores can overcharge uh, for the use of certain cards. I mean, they can increase the price. Say, if you pay me with American Express, it would be 3% more than if you pay me with Visa or in cash. Uh, in that case, uh, which of course the banks have tended to, uh, to uh, try to eliminate, but in, in that case, it's arguable that <clears throat> we probably do not have a two-sided market because no matter what the platform, in this case American Express does, the uh, retailers can change the allocation of cost by passing on some of the costs that they pay to uh, the uh, customers. If, on the other hand, we are in a legal system where it is forbidden for uh, uh, retailers to overcharge, I mean, to pass on the charge to the customers of the, uh, uh, of the commission that they pay to uh, the platform, uh, in that case, the platform is the one which is in charge of the two prices. There's nothing that the retailer can pass on. Uh, therefore, there is no side transaction that can defeat the purpose of uh, the platform. And we are uh, really in the rocher tirol definition of what is a, uh, um, a two-sided uh, platform. So it means that markets may transform themselves sometimes. They, the same market may become a two-sided market or may become a, a one-sided market depending on the environment uh, uh, and in particular the legal environment in which it is uh, working, but also, of course, depending on the governance structures of the platforms. So the point there is to say it's not by nature that uh, in many cases that the market is a two-sided market. One has to look at the circumstances of the case to know wh whether indeed there is a two-sided market. I'm going to go faster on the other two definitions, the event schmalency definition, which is a bit wider and focuses more on the transactional remedy uh, which is offered by the platform than on the structure of price, which was where Rocher and Tirol were putting their emphasis. And events and schmalency basically say that a multi-sided platform 
uh, has two groups or more groups of customers, of consumers, who need each other, who cannot capture the value of their mutual attraction and rely on a catalyst to facilitate their interaction. So it's more focused, this definition, on the interaction between the fact that if there are more people coming to, let's say, the, uh, the uh, shopping mall, uh, it will be more interesting for the uh, retailers to open shop there. If there are more shops there, it will be more interesting for the people to come there. There is an interaction, uh, much less emphasis is uh, given to the conditions uh, of the uh, platform. Uh, the third definition is the Risman uh, definition. I mean, there are a few more, but, uh, but those are the main ones that, um, um, which is the simplest uh, uh, one, in, uh, so to speak, uh, which s basically says that uh, 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 two-sided platform is a platform where there are indirect network externalities. Uh, some kind of interdependence or externality between groups of agents that are served by an in intermediary. So it's the looser definition, the more general one. I'm bringing this because we have three definitions, and one could argue, and Nicolas Petit, uh, uh, a writer from, a professor from Louvain in particular, has argued that those definitions are not uh, equal. I mean, that, that some platforms that could be a uh, platform under uh, the uh, Risman definition would not qualify under the Evans uh, definition or uh, under the Rochet-Tirol definition. So a certain uncertainty about what it is that, w that we mean by a two-sided market. So I think that one of the ways to look at this is to go back to the elements and to basically say that a two-sided market uh, is a market where first you have two distinct group of customers, uh, second, you have an indirect externalities between the two. More of one group attracts more of the other group. And third, where the price structure is non-neutral. In other words, where the platform sets a price structure which will maximize uh, the profits of the platform. And that price structure cannot be challenged or can only be marginally challenged by a side transaction between uh, the players. Now, if we go to each one of uh, those uh, uh, elements, there are two distinct groups of consumers. There can be many more. Uh, we, have, we may have multi-sided markets. We'll show an example in a minute. Um, the, all those groups of consumers need to rely on the platform uh, to uh, intermediate their transaction between them. They cannot easily make that transaction among themselves for whatever reason. They are not located in the same place. It would be very costly. I mean, one can find uh, many reasons why they, it's not so easy to uh, uh, have their, the transaction through themselves and it's easier uh, to have them or less costly to have them through the platform. Um, and the two-sided platform provides this intermediation service to the two groups uh, simultaneously. Uh, second, there are ex indirect externalities. This is the most important element, uh, uh, I think, uh, that the value that a consumer uh, on one side realizes from the platform increases with the number of customers on the other side. Uh, this is not new, but uh, I mean, to remind you of maybe of a famous story, which was when when Edison was running around the United States showing that he had just invented the telephone and how wonderful an invention this was, he went to all the big cities in the US and set up a demonstration. And uh, he got to Chicago and uh, so you know, he talked in one room and through his telephone, uh, his voice was heard in another room. And the mayor of Chicago was uh, there, he's reputed to have said, this is fantastic, I think that Chicago should have won. Now, having one telephone, of course, is not going to get you very far. There's no one to talk to. Uh, the value of having a telephone is the fact that it's someone, someone on the other side of the line. Uh, and this is exactly the same thing uh, in the uh, two-sided markets. Uh, the value of the platform to one side is precisely the fact that there's another group of customers uh, on the other side. And the largest the group of consumers, uh, the more interesting is uh, the platform. Uh, this is, in the media, for example, well known, the more readers you have, uh, the more interesting it is for the advertisers, uh, and 
this is a little bit less obvious, but uh, the more advertising you have, or rather the highest the price uh, paid per advertising, uh, the better is the quality of the paper, and therefore the more re the readers you have. Uh, okay. Finally, uh, the price uh, structure set by the platform is non-neutral, uh, which means that uh, it, it changes the volume uh, depending on how the costs of this intermediation is allocated, changes the volume of transaction, uh, and this is what the platform is uh, trying to do by choosing a particular structure, uh, and this structure cannot be altered. Now, examples, I'm going to go very fast because you know those. Uh, an, a typical uh, two-sided platform, uh, according to a definition, would be uh, games uh, and consoles. Uh, where you have developers on one side and you have people who play games on the other side and in between you have the platform, which may be Nintendo or whatever. Uh, uh, so the writers of applications want to write game for brands that appeal to a lot of uh, customers and the customers want to buy consoles if they can play a large number of games. Uh, second typical example, of course, is uh, the banking cases, uh, which gave rise to this literature. Uh, third are the digital platform, like Android. Uh, same thing, you know, the more developers uh, and the more apps, the more popular is the software, uh, and the more popular is the software with the consumers, the uh, more interesting it is for the app developers to write for this software. Uh, okay. Uh, the shopping malls, which have, uh, are usually uh, regarded as being a two-sided market between stores and, and consumers, uh, I put a question mark because, as I said, I mean, some people say, yeah, but they do. Uh, pres presumably, the stores, if they were unhappy with the, with the charge that they get from the, uh, from the platform, could pass it on to uh, the uh, consumers, and this would be a violation of the fact that the side payments cannot alter the structure uh, of payment. Last one, I think, uh, or no, uh, next to last one, uh, something quite important in, in the US, uh, health plans, uh, where uh, you have a platform that has uh, simultaneously doctors, care facilities, and patients, and uh, organizes the interface between the, those uh, uh, selected uh, uh, care facilities and doctors and the patients that are part of the plan. And finally, but this doesn't need any, uh, we can have multi-sided platform and Apple would be an extremely good example where you have not only two sides like uh, you have with uh, Amazon and the Kindle, but uh, you have many different services that can be exchanged on, on the platform. So let me go to the economics of uh, the, the two-sided markets um, and the pricing. Um, the pricing on one side is not the typical pricing uh, uh, responding to a demand uh, that we know in one-sided market because the lower the pricing, the more people are going to be attracted, which is going to have an effect on the other side and attract the, the other side, uh, and therefore the benefit of attracting the other side must be integrated into the uh, computation uh, that uh, uh, you uh, need to know to what, it, if you are looking, what is the optimal price on one side. Uh, the pricing decisions will include the elasticity of the response of the other side uh, uh, and the markup charge on the other side. If the other side is highly profitable and if uh, lowering the price on your side uh, attracts a lot of the other side. The emblematic case there that everybody has in mind, of course, are nightclubs where women, females don't pay and male pay. Uh, okay, so you, by setting a price equal to zero, you actually increase the volume of people in your nightclubs and your revenues uh, because you not make less f money on the female, but many much more money on the males. Uh, um, This means that, uh, if I uh, jump here, that you do not try to maximize. So you have two sides, the side one where you have the consumers, let's say, and the side two where you have business. Uh, uh, if you think of uh, media, you don't try to maximize profits on one market and then on the other. 
as a matter of fact, uh, you, what would be uh, the case if you were to do that, uh, you would have the uh, little blue uh, rectangles, uh, maximum, is, maximum price for the consumers and maximum price for the uh, uh, advertisers. But if you have a much lower price on the side of the consumers, many more readers, this makes your uh, publication much more uh, desirable for the media, as a result of which the demand curve of the media shifts to the right, and as a result of which you can charge the big red rectangle and maximize uh, your profit uh, uh, altogether. Um, this, of course, leads to a number of, of consequences, uh, but the seemingly anomalous zero price on one side doesn't mean predation, uh, and doesn't even mean that you're not maximizing profit. And that could be true also of uh, negative prices uh, uh, as well. And uh, if we think of a uh, uh, digital platform like Microsoft or, or others, uh, clearly uh, they uh, operate uh, in this way. One way to represent it and to see why it is consistent with profit maximization, possibly to have a zero price on one side, is just if adding a user increases the value of the platforms, it also adds a cost, but if the sum of those two is much larger than zero, then the value is larger than the cost and it means that you gain by adding uh, freely uh, a user. Um, you also have to deduct the cost of servicing uh, the added uh, user that you've had. So if you have a cost of servicing which is not uh, too high, then altogether the value added to your network is superior uh, both to the cost of having uh, one more user and to the cost of servicing the user. And we do have plenty of examples of this uh, Adobe PDF, uh, which is something that we all use, uh, being an excellent example of this. Now let me come to what are the differences between two-sided markets and one-sided markets. Um, the key difference, of course, is that the computation uh, uh, that uh, one does is not limited to what happens on one side of the market. Uh, we are not in, uh, uh, we do equate uh, marginal revenue and marginal cost, but it's taking into consideration the interaction between the two sides rather than uh, doing it as in one side of the market on one side only. Uh, okay, so I think that this is the uh, crucial. Uh, so taking into consideration the marginal revenue that you can get uh, uh, on the other side. The lesson there, very clearly, is that any economic analysis of antitrust issue in two-sided markets that fails to account for the independent demand uh, for the multi-sided platform, either, either by explicitly considering this demand in the model uh, or by accounting for possible bias from not doing so, is going to be very unreliable. The fact that it's going to be very unreliable doesn't mean that it's not going to be done. I mean, there's an excellent example that you don't know about, but as I was on the plane yesterday, the French Competition Authority came out with a decision on Nintendo uh, where the issue was whether uh, it had maintained the price of consoles at uh, too high a price uh, uh, or whether it had engaged in resale price maintenance on that side of the market. Um, the decisions of the competition authority has five lines at the beginning to say, ah, we know that this is a two-sided market. And then it has 15 pages and say, let's look at console. Uh, completely forgetting what are the possible benefits or what is the economics of this and the fact that, uh, in fact, Nintendo, like any other uh, uh, firms of that kind, has a vested interest in having a console which is as cheap as possible because that's what's going to increase the number of people who have a console, make it more interesting for developers uh, to uh, write games to play uh, this, and therefore increase the total revenue of Nintendo. Um, but this kind of uh, error, so to speak, or, uh, you know, first I say, yes, yes, of course, it's a two-sided market. And then either I look at side one, and after that at side two, and I forget completely the interdependency is quite frequent, uh, even now uh, among a number of uh, competition authorities. So the methodology that we want to follow turns around three things, uh, trying to answer 
First question, how each side will react to a given move on the part of the platform. Second, how the platform will react to moves on the different sides and how each side will react to the, each of the other, to, uh, the other sides. Uh, and unless one has devoted attention to this, the conclusions that one can arrive uh, when looking at two-sided markets are going to be very unreliable. There's another factor which is more complicated, which is the fact that those platforms tend to develop extremely rapidly and to change their business model quite rapidly, which raises complex questions about when the competition authority should intervene and, uh, uh, and uh, what is the, the business model. We know that uh, often the competition authorities intervene very rapidly because they are afraid that there is going to be a winner-take-all kind of uh, mechanism. In other words, that the most successful platform is going to become the unique platform going to displace uh, uh, everybody else. Uh, this is not uh, always the case, but in any case, we also have to look at the dynamics of the market uh, when we intervene. Now, quick question on what are the limits of the Basically, none of the instruments that we use in traditional competition analysis work as, uh, I mean, directly works when we're talking about two-sided market. Uh, the learner index, the SNP test, the critical loss formula are all based on the consideration of one demand uh, curve and uh, one reaction to, to define uh, the relevant market uh, uh, by asking uh, does the hyp hypothetical monopolist has an interest in increasing its price by, uh, I don't know, 5%? Uh, uh, and if the answer is no, because then enough people will move to another product, then it means that this other product is in the same market, and then you start again with the two products and ask the same question. Okay. Um, well, if we take the uh, uh, SNP test, uh, the indirect effect should uh, uh, go into uh, this because this is what the platform tries to maximize, is the revenue from the two sides. Um, if you apply it to each uh, side, uh, do you get the same result that you would get if you applied it uh, uh, to, uh, to the whole? Uh, in general, the answer is clearly not. Yet this is what was done in the first data case in the U.S., uh, which was, a, a, uh, again, a, a ranking platform case, uh, where, for reasons which are not very clear in the decision, uh, the DOJ decided that it was only going to apply the, uh, the test uh, to uh, when user on, uh, sorry, uh, on, the, on the merchant side. Uh, okay. Now, if you decide that it has to be applied taking the two uh, prices together, then the question is exactly how do you administer the test? You say the typical SNP test is to say, let's say there's a 5% increase or 10% increase in price, and let's look to see whether it's profitable for the hypothetical monopolist. If we're on a two-sided market, it's the 10% increase of what? Of both prices at the same time? One price, the other price? Uh, are there different ways to compute uh, this possible increase? Uh, if we have interdependency between the two, uh, an increase of 10% on one side may not have at all the same effect as an increase in the price of 10% on the other effect on the other side. Uh, so there are definitely difficulties uh, there, um, and there are even more difficulty, of course, when you apply the test uh, to when one side uh, receives. Uh, no price whatsoever because an increase of zero price by 10% is still zero, so you don't get very far. So what it means that one has to re-engineer the test. I mean, the idea of the test is probably the good one, but the way you implement it is uh, very different from the way you would implement it on a one-sided uh, market. Um, equally, assessing market powers in two-sided market, you can't look at price cost margin on one side to decide that there is market power. As a matter of fact, what is most important for market power is the question of knowing whether one side multi-home or not, and whether one side single home or not. If one side multi-home, but the other side single home, in other words, uses only this platform to get that kind of service, it means that the other side has to go through this platform if it wants to get 
to these to these consumers, and it means that the platform has on those consumers that single home monopoly power. But this is a very different reasoning than just looking at price cost margin. As we said, what import is what's important is the uh, uh, the uh, structure of the price and not the absolute uh, value of the price in uh, two-sided markets. Okay, let me finish with nine fallacies, things which are usually true in one-sided markets uh, for competition authorities, but not necessarily true or sometimes absolutely not true uh, for uh, two-sided markets. Uh, the first one is the fact that an efficient price structure should be set to reflect the relative costs. Uh, uh, in other words, that the costs should be in line, uh, with, that the prices on each side should be in line with the cost has nothing to do with this. It is profit maximizing to set the price at a level which will attract a sufficient number on the other side so that the total value of the platform uh, will be increased. Um, and if, to go back to an example which is uh, always the one that everybody understand uh, of nightclubs, uh, if, the, uh, if it pays the platform, if it pays the nightclub to have free drinks for women, uh, it is not inefficient, it is not uh, against the profit maximizing uh, uh, that uh, men should be the ones who pay and that maybe they pay uh, more than the cost. The question is how can the platform develop its uh, volume of transaction? Um, second fallacy, competition necessarily reduces price to cost. That's what we learn in one sided market for all the reasons which I've already mentioned. Uh, uh, this is absolutely not true uh, uh, in the case of two-sided market. Um, the fact that men are charged above cost by nightclubs doesn't mean that they don't compete with each other. If you want to know whether they compete, you either have to ask yourself whether they are, there's a reason uh, that would lead to some market power, for example, the fact that one group of consumer would be uh, only multi-homing, only going to this particular uh, nightclub, or you want to look at the overall cost of the nightclub on both sides and the overall revenues to see whether this overall margin is uh, above uh, what would be a regular... Uh, uh, this is fairly simple, but it doesn't prevent the competition authority throughout the world to make statements which are completely unjustified. Uh, I'm taking the OFT. I was on the board of the OFT for a long time, so okay. Um, the OFT preliminary conclusion is that it, it was a master, master card case, so a case of a uh, uh, credit card uh, and uh, the charge to the uh, retailers. Um, MasterCard has not justified the level at which it has set its, uh, uh, its uh, interbank fee. Uh, the MasterCard in interbank fee has been set at a level much higher than this cost. This is irrelevant. This is not uh, the issue. Um, second fallacy, uh, second example, this one from Australia. Competitive pressures in card payment network in Australia have not been sufficiently strong to bring interchange fees into line with cost. Interchange fees are the fees that, pay, that are paid by the retailers, but there are two sides to the market, so you can't make any uh, pronouncement on one side uh, uh, of that kind. Fallacy number three, the fact that a high price cost margin indicates market power. I've already mentioned this, uh, so I'm not going to go into it, except for giving you an example uh, in the American Express uh, case, uh, where uh, the court uh, uh, in the uh, US uh, said uh, that the merchant fees had increased in the period that followed the introduction of the anti-steering provision by Amex. Uh, and other car networks. Uh, a price increase on one side of the platform can increase overall output, so there's nothing we can derive from this. Just because the price increase doesn't mean that there was anything anti-competitive about the introduction of this. If one wants to see whether indeed this uh, anti-steering device uh, was uh, anti-competitive, one would have to look both at the increase in price on, on the sides of the uh, retailers and also on the benefits that were uh, gotten by uh, the uh, uh, customers. 
A price below marginal cost indicates predation. This is clearly not true in, uh, so I'm not going to spend much more time on this, but this is again a fallacy in two-sided markets. Uh, uh, a lot of platforms are usually profitable by having a zero price on one side of the market, so they are not predating. Um, an increase in competition necessarily results in a more efficient structure of prices. Uh, for the reasons which I've already uh, mentioned, uh, this is not necessarily uh, true. Uh, what will uh, and what an increase in competition will do, it will decrease the profitability of the platform in general, but not necessarily an efficient structure of prices. If by efficient structure of prices, one means that it's going to be a cost-based structure. Um, um, Again, uh, there are, uh, let me give you an example of this. Um, in Australia, the same uh, report, uh, why it is possible that the collective process may lead to an entrance fee being set at an efficient level, the condition under which this is like to occur in practice, strong competition between card schemes, strong competition between credit cards and other payment instruments, and the balance of issuing and acquiring interest in the fee setting uh, process do not prevail in Australia. The implicit assumption is that if those conditions prevail, then the, the uh, price charge would reflect the costs, which is no basis in uh, two-sided markets. Um, in mature market, uh, price structures that do not reflect costs are no longer justified. Again, this is, there is absolutely no reason to believe that. Uh, as long as there is the interdependency between the two sides, uh, there is a reason to have a structure which will maximize the benefits of the platforms as a 